can also get involved um, about the Chilean higher education uh, system, uh, university basically. Um, some of you have been here for, for some time, others will, will um, uh, have just arrived. And in some cases, I'm not sure if you, you have double, double uh, you're visiting two countries. None of you, right? Some of them are visiting yeah. Argentina yeah. and Chile. Yeah, yeah and maybe you, for the year in Brazil. Mexico. Okay, that, that's so exactly, that? yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's really interesting. Yeah. And, yeah. and when you compare the differences, it's going to be amazing how, how different um, some uh, other systems are, okay? Before I can start, can you just give your names and uh, where you are from, what are you doing here, and um, your area of uh, expertise? Okay. Um, I'm Katrina. Um, I'm from Loyola University, Chicago, and I'm studying at La Universidad Alberto Hurtado. And my major is English, but here I'm studying periodismo. Ah, journalism, huh? Yeah. Hmm. yeah. Ch Chicago, it's very popular with our Chilean grantees. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this it's a year, great city. Yeah, this year we have uh, actually three yeah. uh, Chileans about to go, or one already left and two are about to go. To which schools? Um, in education, I think. Right. Yeah. University of Chicago. University of Chicago, yeah. Uh, University of Chicago at the education, yeah. Great, great. Um, my name is Elvis Loro. Um, I attend Syracuse University, but I'm here at the Tepicia Universidad Católica. Um, and my uh, semi-expertise is... <laughs> Asuntos públicos, yeah. and Juan Gómez Mons. Yeah. Asuntos públicos is in just by the, the hill, the uh, Santa Lucia. Uh, that, that, that. Yeah, that's where you're going. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Great. Well, perfect. Thanks. So I'll, I'll begin giving you and um, any questions you have, and then we, we can make the parallels with the, um, with, the, um, with the higher education system, and then we'll give you some tips about probably the tips I gave you are quite, quite obsolete. You probably, with, with the few weeks you've been here, you know a lot more <laughs> what's going on than what I do. So, <clears throat> um, so. okay. Um, the Fulbright program as, as we know it today um, was proposed in 1945 by the then uh, Senator Fulbright from Arkansas. It was approved in uh, 46, and um, the first commission in Latin America was actually uh, established here in Chile. So we're the oldest. It, we started in 1955, so we've been uh, 61 years so far. That's quite a lot. Uh, I've not been the 61 years old. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and from 1955 to 1997, it was um, a commission which uh, mostly was uh, supported by the U.S. Embassy. In 1997, a new agreement was signed by both countries, so it became a binational commission, meaning that both the U.S. government and the Chilean government contribute funding. Um, uh, and this new organization now is autonomous. It has a board of directors, an eight-member board. Four of them are nominated by the uh, U.S. ambassador in Chile, and the other four by the Minister of Foreign Affairs, the Chilean Minister of Foreign Affairs, and it's basically the board who, who makes or takes the decisions on policy here in Chile. The, the, the Fulbright program is quite structured. It's very rigid in many aspects in terms of creating new programs, but there's still quite a flexibility within each country. Um, these are the... Um, sorry. Um, we have like two main lines of, uh, of work. One is for U.S. grantees, and then the other one is for Chilean grantees. In terms of U.S. grantees, uh, we have three main programs. The first one is the uh, Fulbright U.S. Scholar Program. This is aimed at faculty uh, from U.S. universities who wish to come to Chile for a period of between three or four months. So it's a whole semester they stay here. 
uh, most of them do teaching and their own research. In some cases, depending on the area, they just concentrate on teaching. Um, as most of the programs of the commission, it is co-funded. That means that we require the Chilean University to contribute uh, a percentage of the total cost. Uh, we bring on average between 13 to 15 per year. Um, and we try to bring them um, in terms of the Chilean semester, so March to July, August to December. So the new group it has, is arriving right now, it's about to arrive, and we'll, spend, we'll stay here until the end of, of December. Um, the other program we have for uh, faculty um, researchers from the U.S. is called the Fulbright Specialist Program. This is a very short-term program, um, usually from two to six weeks. So it's for faculty who basically cannot afford to spend a whole semester here. They can come uh, for two to six weeks, uh, mostly to do um, modules of uh, graduate courses, work on curriculum development, uh, work on perhaps a specific research program they have with Chilean faculty. Um, and we, this program was, um, was quite large. We had 16, but due to financial constraints, we are up to six right now. And it's again, it's co-shared with Chilean universities. Everything we do has to be co-shared. If not, our program will be much smaller than what it actually is. This is not the same in every country. Uh, probably you will see when in Brazil. Well, Brazil is, is, is a bit different. Yeah, yeah Bra Brazil has they ups and downs, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Right now they're on an upswing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, uh, the differences are remarkable. Um, in some countries, you see that the, uh, the local government is, is not providing funding. So it's just based on what the grant from the U.S. government. In some cases, universities basically do not contribute. So the number of youth scholars coming is quite reduced, as opposed to Chile, where there's a, it's an interesting and important contribution by the, by the Chilean university. And that gives us the flexibility to bring more scholars, uh, more researchers. Um, and for the U.S. student program, this is, this is we, we have one of the largest U.S. student programs in the region. Um, this is, the, the process for this is, is, is quite different. Um, there's a, a first selection within each university in the U.S. So ev every year there should be a call for applications by the, the, the university. So all the students who are interested in participating would, would have to present uh, like, a, like an application. Then the university makes a first selection and submits that list to um, IAE, who is the... Um, organization in the U.S. who does most of the work for us in terms of recruitment, in terms of selecting uh, scholars and students. After that, they make a second selection process, and then they send each country a short list of all the approved participants, and each country then makes a final decision on who is selected. So it's a very competitive process. It has like three stages at your local university, at IAE and then at each Fulbright Commission in each respective country. Um, this is mostly funded, entirely funded, I would say, by the Fulbright Commission. We bring students for nine months, from March to November. Um, most, of, most of it is self-placed, so the student um, contacts the university or contacts the, uh, the scholar in Chile. We provide lists of um, areas, disciplines um, that all Chilean universities would like to receive students in those areas, so that we help. And if you want help, we'll give it to you. We'll, be, we'll make the contacts as we do for the scholars and as we do for the specialists. Yeah? Uh, we give up to 15 grants. It varies depending on, on our budgetary constraints, um, but it's, it's, a, it's a great program. So they arrive in March. We have a big, big meeting, orientation meeting. Uh, then each of them go to each of the universities, which can be in Santiago, could be up north in Arica, could be down south in Punta Arenas. We have them everywhere in, in Chile. And uh, at the end, probably the second or third week of November, we fly them all, and we have a final meeting. So they present all the, um, all, all, all the, 
projects, the stage at what it is, and all that. Yeah. This is probably the most interest for you guys, yeah. because it's, it's mainly pointed at young people who are just recently graduating. Yeah. Sure. How many people typically apply to this A lot. I think the last number I have it's close to 10,000, I think. Yeah, 10,000, 10, 15 slots. No, 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 10,000 no, for, for the whole world. For the whole world. Worldwide. For the whole world. Yeah. You don't have to come to Chile. Right, right. Okay, okay. Yeah. 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 So it depends on what you it's want to study. And, but it's nice because you form the relationships with the universities here. So, yeah. 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 It is competitive. Yeah, no, it's very competitive. It, it, Being a Fulbrighter is it you know, competitive. Pretty yeah. 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 Um, this year we have. 13, I think, students. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, I think the, 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 um, right now the process, uh, just the competition just finished in the U.S. Um, so they're, they're you know, making, doing the short list and probably in sometime in November we should get a short list and that goes to the board and the board decides who, who gets it. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, an, it's, a, it's a great experience. Um, yeah. It's really good. And, uh, and the great thing of having so many U.S. students all over, the, all over Chile is that you can travel, you can always have somewhere to stay. So, so that's great. It's really good. Um, we have some smaller programs which we're defining whether we're going to continue with them. One is the Distinguished Awards and Teaching Program. That's for U.S. teachers, uh, both grade or, or, or high school that, um, that uh, work at the school in the U.S. and would like to have like a semester abroad for pro professional development. So they apply, it's, it's a, uh, every year they have the competition, they have to submit a project. And in Chile basically what they do is uh, they interact with different schools, uh, they look at the methodologies to see what they can take back to the U.S. And also they have what we call a capstone project, so we put them in touch with a faculty from a university who is going to be like the advisor and will help him or her develop their project while they're in Chile. It's for up to four months. <coughs> and for Chileans, um, we have our, our master's grant. All our grants for Chileans are also partial. That means that we rely a lot on the U.S. university giving some sort of financial aid. Or for the Chilean national government program, a scholarship program called Becas Chile, also to, to provide some funding. Uh, we, we've, the master's grant is the one that goes with the most um, um, discussion. Um, we've been reducing the areas. So um, mostly so they're more oriented to professional degrees, law, the arts, pu public policy, and the other disciplines such as natural, natural sciences or economics. We try to um, encourage students, students to pursue the PhD, not so much the master's. And it's co-funded with, um, with Becas Chile and with U.S. universities. We also have a faculty development program that's for Chileans who are inserted in academia but who do not have a terminal degree and uh, they require it. Uh, so this is a, a, a grant that has basically like three legs. One is at the U.S. University which will provide a tuition waiver for the student. Uh, the Chilean University will provide the maintenance for the, for the faculty while they're in the U.S. and the Fulbright Commission provides the rest, which is the difference between the maintenance rate the Chilean University gives versus the uh, rates we, we, we manage, uh, airfares and health insurance. It's, it works out quite good. <coughs> this is the, the core PhD grant, is open to all areas. Again, uh, it's mostly through, um, um, through funding through the uh, Chilean National uh, scholarship program or through um, uh, grants given by or tuition waivers given by or graduate assistantships given by U.S. universities. Um, this is our most um, important grant. Um, as, you, as you probably have experienced so far or as, as you will experience, 
um, the differences or the opportunities most students have to learn English is quite diverse. If you go to a private school here in Chile, most likely you'll have a very good acquisition of a second language, which is nowadays is mostly English. Even if you go to a German school, probably you will learn more English than German. If you go to an Italian school, basically that's, that's the norm. Um, but if you go to public school, uh, the chances of you learning English is, are very slim. So here we have a group of Chileans who have excelled in high school, who have ex ex excelled at the university level, but unfortunately do not have the English that will allow them to go to pursue graduate school in the U.S. So what we do is we select them based on academic merit, but also on the fact of, of that they come from vulnerable populations. And we have three criteria for that. First is that they have studied in a public school, high school. Second, that their parents only were able to study until a high school diploma, not college education. And the third is that they did their um, university studies through a credit or through a grant. So we select them. Um, we selected 20 last year. They're undergoing English courses in Chile for a year, and then we send them to the US for intensive English for six months, and then they begin the PhDs. This is like our STAR program. It's, it adds a component of, uh, it becomes a more democratic process in the sense that it's open basically to all. And uh, because what we, we, we have seen is that most of the people who apply to a Fulbright grant or to a Becas Chile grant, um, one of the um, indirect um, requirements is that you must have a decent level of English that will allow you to get a letter of admission from a U.S. university. If you don't, you're out. And this allows for that. And you all will find that it's a big impediment for Chile writ large. I mean, the, the, the level, the English proficiency level in Chile is among the lowest, if not the lowest, in yeah. Latin America, 4%. So for the full range of programs, and especially as you're looking at education, you'll see the, the vast differences between public schools and private schools, Santiago versus regions. regions. And just the, the inequality in the full range of opportunities that that so. There are, there are. Look, yeah. if you look at just in Santiago, the difference between the public and the private is huge. And you go to the regions, then that's an added one. And if you go to the regions in rural areas, that's a third impediment. So somebody who lives has lived all its life and went to high school in the regions, and in a rural area, probably. The closest he or she has gone into English is probably the name of a street with an English name. No, no more than that. It's, it's quite dramatic. Yeah. So the aim of this program is basically to select, identify these students who are very good, excellent academically, uh, but if do, they, do not, they don't have the chance of learning English through the, this, this process, there's, they will be unable to go to an uh, English-speaking country for a graduate degree. Um, this one is basically we've not, we've, we've not we've mostly discontinued it due to funding. Uh, the Humphrey, it's another big big uh, grant. This is for uh, Chileans also going to the U.S. Uh, professional development more, aimed at people who are not interested in a degree-seeking program. So they go to the U.S. for about ten months in different areas. Um, there are about seventeen schools in the U.S. universities that. Um, based on discipline or area would house them. So they spend about four or five years um, taking uh, like refresher courses at the universities and then they do four or five months like an internship at a public, a, pro a private NGO or could even be at a university. Uh, it's a great program, really good. It's one of the best, probably this, this is the best professional <coughs> development program there is in the world. The nexus is um, it's out, no. is out because of funding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah it was funded by the U.S. Um, Department of State. Then they cut it because of funding. Then Brazil, at some point, was very wealthy. Um, yeah. Not so much now. <laughs> <laughs> so they actually funded it. They funded it for for two years. 
50 people or yeah. something. Yeah. yeah. Something crazy. Uh, most likely yeah. this won't happen again. <laughs> Knowing the situation in Brazil. Yeah. 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 Uh, we also have a distinction we're teaching for Chileans. Um, but again, this is under discussion whether we're going to continue or not. Hmm? English and is an issue. It is an issue. It's, yeah. It's difficult to find teachers at uh, grade or high schools, ideally in public schools. You know, who, who have a good command of English, it's difficult. Unless you're an English teacher, yeah. But you, you can only send English teachers to, to the U.S. I mean, the idea is for them to go in science and technology, social sciences, humanities. Yeah. And, well, that's a list of, uh, of uh, uh, known alumni. Yeah. So that's more or less the, um, the, uh, for the Fulbright program. Let me talk a little bit about the Chilean higher educational system, maybe, so you can... I'm not going to go into the grade and, and, and high school because it's, um, to be honest, it's, um, there's no point. Um, I, can, I can send you this presentation. It's too long. It's, it's gone. But um, let me just go. Um, so this is the, um, um, it's a decentralized system. Um, you probably will hear very often, private versus public. Yeah, uh, it's not the best yeah. cut. I'll, I'll I'll explain you a little bit why. Yeah. Um, let me go to the uh, university. I can send you this afterwards, so you can have it as a. So if if you have at some point doubts. Claudia might find it useful, right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, here it is. Sweat. <laughs> yeah, the the uh, university system in Chile. Until 1982, uh, we had a fixed number of universities in Chile. Okay, and uh, what we we call now traditional universities. In 1982, we had a decentralization process whereby the government of Chile allowed for new uh, universities to be created, and those have been called non-traditional private universities. Yeah. Now, why this is wrong is because the, those who were created before 82, the traditional, are also private, some, in some cases. So this is what I'm going to talk to. Nine. Yeah. Nine yeah. Nine. So the big, the big uh, definition or change is prior to 1981, after 1981. The universities which were created prior to 1981, 82, are, some of them a group are State universities, University of Chile, Universidad de Bio, eh, Universidad de la, la Serena, um, Usach, eh, Usach yeah. Utem, Utem Umse. Umse, yeah. Most, Ufla, yeah. yeah, most of the universities which are traditional prior to 1982, who are state-owned outside of Santiago, are relatively new because they were the big they were branches of the University of Chile in the regions but the decentralization process basically what they did is no they will become uh, universities on their own right so for example in Valparaíso we have Universidad Valparaíso which is a state university it used to be Universidad de Chile sede Valparaíso but now it's Universidad Valparaíso Universidad um, de la Serena used to be Universidad de Chile la Serena now it's Universidad de la Serena so that's the distinction. And also you have private universities under the traditional uh, scheme, which are Católica. Católica is a, is a traditional, but it's private. Um, Universidad Federico Santa Maria, Universidad Concepción, Universidad Católica de, de Valparaíso. All the, all the universidades católicas are traditional, but are private. Okay. Now, after 1982, we have a new uh, system, so new universities are started to, to being created, and those are like Universidad Adolfo Ibáñez, Universidad Diego Portales, Universidad Los Andes. All of them, until last year, were private. Mm -hmm. But last year, the government decided to create two new state universities in two areas where there was basically no other uh, offer. One is in O'Higgins, the Rancagua region, which is very close to Santiago, and the other one is in uh, Aysen, down, down south. Uh, those two universities are, being, are in the process of being 
uh, created, the, the uh, statutes are being drafted, and they claim that in March of 2017 they will start. There's a huge question mark on that. Yeah. Uh, they might Special. start, but we don't know with how many, um, uh, we call them uh, carreras here, with how many majors. Uh, so there's a big discussion. Well, they don't have the funding, really. Yeah, they that, have that's big, big problem. issues, yeah. And we had a big problem with one of them, the one in Aysen, that they decided to remove the uh, rector and yeah. put another one. Yeah, <laughs> we know the new one. Uh, yeah, yeah. We know, I know, Maria Teresa Mas, I know very well, yeah. But the thing is that in those two regions, there are universities. So there's been a, you know, kind of like a controversy saying, why didn't the government support the universities, the institutions that already uh, are, you the know, Pula, settled yeah. there, Pula, so. versus opening to new ones. And also, some universities that open in those two regions had to close down because they didn't have any uh, students or hardly any students. So... And even it's private cool. universities get government funding, so it's not yeah. like U.S. public, private. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The funding is, is very, it's, it's, very it's, complex. It, it's complex, yeah. <laughs> there, 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 currently, there are like two ways by which universities can receive money from the government. One is what we call direct funding. Okay, direct funding is basically the government gives them money directly. And then there's the indirect funding. And the in, that's where it gets a bit complicated. Indirect funding is associated with students. So if a good student goes to the University of Chile, for example, which is a traditional state school, that university will get funding, indirect funding because that student decided to go that to university. But if a good student, I'll, I'll explain why I mean by good student, um, decides to go to a private university, even though it's not a public, that university will also get indirect funding from, from the government. Um, and they, they do it based on the best um, the SEO school. Yeah, they ha there's an entrance examination just like the SAT for yeah. Chile called the PSEU. So they have a number. It used to be the 20,000 best. 20, 27,500. 20, 20, okay, that's the, the last yeah. figure. Yeah. So the, 20, the first 27,500 students, the best with the best rankings, um, they will make their own decision, autonomous decision, where to go. And based on that decision, the university where they go will get indirect funding from the Chilean government. And you can imagine that students from private schools score the highest on the yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. With that said, there's another big issue currently in, in Chile, which, which talks about the main, um, the main um, um, uh, changes the current government has implemented. And some of them have been completed, uh, but the, most, uh, the one that has created the most discussion is what we call gratuity in higher education. So at some point, the idea was that any Chilean who wanted to study a higher education would be uh, free of cost. That obviously couldn't happen because in terms of the money that is required. So the government said, well, we have to fund this. And how do we fund it? We increase specific taxes for specific groups, for a specific both income tax, or it could be also corporate tax. Now, when they made the math, they found out that it would be impossible to begin, I mean, to offer 100% gratuity because you just couldn't. So they've decreased it. And that's where the discussion and it got a bit, a bit, a bit um, strange because the percentage of gratuity went up and down, 50, 60, 70. It, 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 it moved too much, I think. Uh, so we didn't know exactly. Now it has been settled. But then there was the other question. Well. Should all universities uh, be subject to um, a, the decision of a student going to a specific university, even though if that university is not uh, a traditional university or a public university, should also receive the, uh, the funding from the state? So they have like a list of approved universities, uh, and they have to meet a specific criteria. All state universities are part of that list. Now, the private universities, to be part of that list, have to meet specific requirements. And also, they have to be willing to do it. Now, One the, of the most specific is to be non-profit. Non-profit, yeah. And they have to prove that it's non-profit. Yeah. Yeah. The problem is the following, is that just pick any university, any private university. For example, somebody wants to study medicine, okay? The cost 
of a student for first year in that university of who wants to study medicine say it's six million pesos. <laughs> it's a lot more, but just uh, it's very expensive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. six, eight. It it varies. Uh, well, the, yeah, the private ones are more expensive. But if that student qualifies uh, for gratuity, then he doesn't have to pay the six million. The Chilean government will give the money to the university. But here's the problem. The Chilean government is not going to pay the six or the eight million. They have a reference amount, which is less than what the actual cost or the cost provided by the university is. So some universities, when they were offered this possibility and they qualified, decided not to enter the gratuity because of this. Others did. You will hear more as, uh, because this is the most uh, recurrent theme currently now in, mm -hmm. in higher education. Uh, the, uh, the other one currently now is the pension system. Pensions um, have overtaken. But yes, the, I uh, think so. Was, yeah. Yeah. It's still, yeah. well, it's been overtaken a little bit, but every editorial will mention education reform. Gratuita is still being debated. Yeah. Um, but it's a lot of the similar issues that we're seeing in the U.S., yeah. both in higher education and in yeah. And in secondary yeah. education. L last Sunday, there was a huge um, manifestation because of the uh, pension system. The pension. Yeah. 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 And, but the higher education system also has what we call the private institutes, technical private institutes. These are four year degrees. Uh, universities are quite different from the US. Uh, a bachelor's degree is a four year you know, degree. Here in, here in Chile, it varies from four, five, six, or even seven with medicine in paper, meaning that you have, you know, the uh, the program is four years or eight semester, five years or ten semester, six years or twelve. But many times students take a bit longer than that. <laughs> yeah, quite a lot. Uh, it is normal for a student to even spend ten years at the university, engineering or medicine. At the Catolica, only 36 percent of students graduate within the time that the, the, the program um, is supposed to be. Yeah, no, it's, take, yeah, you nice. know, one, two, three more years. No, yeah, absolutely, it's very yeah. common. It's very common. Um, in some cases, uh, it's because of, um, like in law, um, it, it because you have to take a t an examination, like a, the bar, more or less. Uh, but then you also have to uh, to do a, a six month, uh, in it's not internship, it's um, mm -hmm. it's kind of kind of an internship there. Yeah. And some people actually keep on postponing. And the, the exam is quite difficult. Uh, a lot of them have to study for six or oh, six months or a whole year just to prepare for the, for the yeah, bar. It's also it's, uh, the Supreme Court. No universities will give you a degree in law. They'll give you what they call licenciatura in derecho. Yeah. But if you want to be a, a lawyer, the exam is it's, uh, you know, take the yeah. Supreme Court because yeah. it's hard. Uh, here's the difference between the U.S. Uh, system. Uh, here you have the grado academicus, which would be the bachelor's degree maybe, more or less. But then you have an extra year to call it titulo profesional, which is non-existent in most, most all over the world. Yeah. yeah. But here they have it. Of so you could you could you you could finish your, your bachelor's, but then you have to go the extra year to get your professional degree. Titulo profesional. Many people don't actually. Most universities, universities in the U.S. would accept for graduate school somebody just with the, uh, with the bachelor's, with the equivalent of the bachelor's, not with the doctorate. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it, it takes a long time, yeah. <laughs> and you can't work in the Chilean public administration unless you have a professional yeah. degree, as a yeah. professional. Yeah. So exactly. if you just have the grado académico. You cannot be, because <laughs> going to, into that a bit... <laughs> Uh, most institutions in Chile would separate the administrative staff versus the professional staff. Yeah. And the difference are mostly in salary. Yeah. Uh, so the Instituto Profesionales are like technical schools. They're four-year degrees. Huh? Uh, mm -hmm. And some of these technical institutes offer engineering, for example. So um, they, what, what they call is Ingeniería Ejecución, which is a bit different from the, uh, the other ones. And also you have the Centro Formación Técnica, which are usually two-year to your technical uh, centers. So that makes the overall uh, offer of higher education. Universities, as I've tried to explain, professional institutes, and um, 
formación técnica. The most known institutos profesionales, you probably will see them, are INACAP and DUOC. The INACAP also offers a university degree. They have both. Um, so this is just funding. Uh, let me just go to university funding. Outdated um, <laughs> figures. I, uh, the Ministry of Education has an update, and so I haven't done <laughs> it um, But uh, this is more or less what I can. Uh, yeah. yeah, this is just. Uh, yeah. So, to get an, an idea, there's a lot of discussion. Um, Chile is, like, you probably will see as we go on, Chile is a country which. Uh, puts a, a lot of um, emphasis on on where you have studied. Status. Yeah. Oh yeah, that a it's lot. where you did your high school. A lot. It's not <laughs> even where you went to university. People will ask you, where did you study? They mean high school. Even if you're 80 years old, they still want to know what high school you went. To. <laughs> Which yeah. is completely uncalled in the U.S. Uh, yeah. You would care Nobody less where, where, what high school you studied. Where, where you study, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Now here it's still it's still very predominant. Because that will largely determine your PSA, which will determine where you go to. Yeah. yeah. And they classify you. And they classify you yeah. Uh, yeah. private, public. Yeah. In in the Chilean yeah. grade yeah. and and yeah. at high school system. Yeah, that's why it's <laughs> There are three <laughs> levels of schools. It's One the private here. schools, then the public schools, which are administered at the uh, local government, at the municipalities. And then you have something in between. Uh, it's a hybrid. Yeah. Well, very much so. Similar. Similar. Yeah. We call them here particular, which is privately owned, but subsidized by the state. It's like the, the transportation system. In, in Chile? Yeah. The, it's privately owned. The, uh, the metro buses? Or Transantiago? El, el metro. El, el metro is, is, is government owned. Uh -huh. it, but the buses are privately owned. Oh, the buses. Yeah. yeah. But they get subsidized by They get subsidized, subsidized, yeah. 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 So that's the uh, that's the uh, so it's it's um, it, it's it's a, it's a way of basically cr creating like silos and where you study it um, high school where you study university it's 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 very complicated but you, you have to live it uh, you you have to sense it um, and it's 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 everywhere. So, so now when you meet someone, make sure you ask them, what did you study? <laughs> <laughs> Funding for the high school is determined locally, like through property taxes, or uh, yeah. no, 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 it's Ministry of Education. No, Ministry of Education yes. assigns X Central. amount of money to the, the, the each municipality. Yeah. So are there gaps between the public schools in terms of funding? Like if you live in a nicer area, is there going to be of course. Okay. absolutely, oh. absolutely. The public <clears throat> schools here in Las Condes, you know, you can't compare them with those in La Pintana. Yeah, right. in, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of uh, infrastructure, meaning the building wise. Uh, they're quite different right. in terms of teachers, in terms of what, uh, what the opportunities the teachers have for in-service training, for example. Yeah, it's a huge difference. And classroom sizes Resources. are huge. Yeah. 40, 45 yeah. students yeah. in a fair. primary classroom. That's supposed to change now with the law, the Carrera Docente, but it's going to take a few years. The teachers have big, yeah. big challenges here. Yeah, yeah. 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 and um, by, by law, uh, um, all institutions who offer the service of either uh, higher education or higher education are non for profit. So you cannot make pro profit out of this. Uh, but the discussion is is, is always present um, because there are, there are different mechanisms whereby some schools, uh, or at least people who control the universities, have separate uh, businesses or companies. Who work closely with the university, and that's somehow you could claim that there is profit. I'll give you an example. For example, I own a university, but I don't own the buildings. My other company owns the building, so company. So, rent so my other company so. rents me. I own both. Rents me the buildings, so I pay rent. 
I, I don't make a profit as a university, right. but most likely I'll make a profit as the company who owns the building and rents the buildings to me. That's a For one example. <laughs> there, there are many others. There is right? a U.S. company that's, that's under... Laureate. Laureate, yes. oh yeah. Laureate he owns... Is. Laureate owns Universidad Andrés Bello, <laughs> Universidad uh -huh. Las Américas, Universidad... Viña del Mar. Viña del Mar o Viña del Mar? Viña del Mar. No, Viña del Mar. And the other one is... The AEP and the School of Music. The Music. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But the, 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 um, the law that says that universities cannot make a profit is the law that created the private universities. Supposedly the traditional universities do not, make, you know, are non-profit. But the law says that only private universities should be non-profit. It doesn't say that the institutos profesionales or CFTs should be non-profit. So most of them are private. Yeah. It's very confusing. No. It's, it's Don't confusing. worry. And it's constantly changing. So. Yeah. <laughs> just, just roll with it. You said it was part of the Constitution? Huh? You said it was part of the Constitution? No, the law. The law. Uh, there's a law that regulates the um, creation of private universities. But anyone can create a private university. The traditional ones are created by law. The private ones are not. You can set up a university if you just, you know, present the right papers. Yeah. So if, if you were, if had been here in eighty two, for example, and when the law was passed, so anybody could create a university, yeah. I could just go there, see a good house, good looking yeah. house, rent it, and put the logo saying, "Yes, yeah, that's actually what happened in many yeah. instances." <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, it happened that way. Hasn't yeah. there been like a few universities that? Have Yes. Then, yes. Yes. And there's been like oh, there's some have, that have disappeared completely now, and have been bought over by others. Others have been closed out. Yeah. Because at at the beginning, the university, the private universities, um, had, had there were two mechanisms to ensure that they were offering, uh, or, or you could certify that the quality was okay. One was that there was a commission which would, you know, go every year and check different programs, and different courses they were offering, and all that. And the other one was that they would have like a sister university, one of the traditional universities. Yes. So University of Chile, University of Catholic, University of Concepcion will work as a, as a parent. Um, at the beginning, it was very common to have like a, like a sister university, but afterwards, most of them decided yeah, to go the other way. way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Because the claim was that students who were, if university decided to have a sister university, students who had to take the, the examinations with the university and then take a second examination mm -hmm. with the sister university. That was too much, they said. Um, so, once they're about, they have to go that, they have to um, pass through about an eight year process. Once that has completed, they get, they reach autonomy. Autonomy means that they are free to offer whatever degree they choose. Uh, but after autonomy, there was another instance created, which is the accreditation and the quality assurance, which is one of the big issues we still have. Um, some of the private universities are very good, extremely good comparable to many traditional universities in terms of quality of teaching, research, um, infrastructure. Other universities, other private universities are quite bad, to be honest. Uh, some of them have disappeared completely. Others have changed name. Others have merged. Um, but there, there's a huge discussion currently. Uh, what happens with these schools, which, uh, according to all the different um, evaluations, they're their, the quality is not up to standard. What's going to happen, for example, to those kids who go to those schools, pay a lot of money, graduate, and then when they go to the workforce, they just don't have a job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Big, big issues, yeah. Oh. yeah. Um, and then, do you need to be a good moment for Kimberly? I know you had some things you wanted sure, to mention. Sure, sure. Sure. Absolutely. Okay. Not to break the flow, but... Yeah, thanks. Um, so from the U.S. Embassy side of things, oftentimes we found in the past we haven't been able to hook up with Gilman, so we're very glad to be able to work with you all. And the embassy part of our portfolio in the public affairs section is dealing with educational exchanges, so and specifically government exchanges, which is Fulbright and Gilman, really. But we love to get to know all U.S. exchange students here because we work a lot with universities and students. Public affairs tends to deal more on the people-to-people -people level, whereas other sections of the embassy are much more government-to-government. -government. 
Um, so we do a lot of work with universities, outreach to students, whether it's bringing U.S. experts or whatnot. Um, so what we really hope is that you all, as Gilmans and part of the U.S. government, um, will can be incorporated into some of the things that we do as an embassy, whether that's a reception at the ambassador's residence or, um, for example, last year we um, sponsored a booth with um, Education USA, which is our sort of educational advising office here in Chile, at Lollapalooza. And um, U.S. foreign exchange students, Gilman's others, um, worked the booth to sort of talk about studying abroad and studying in the U.S. And then you got to go to Lollapalooza. So Lollapalooza Chile? Or Lollapalooza? Yeah. Lollapalooza Chile. Yeah. 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 So yeah. some of it's really fun. Yeah. Um, the big thing for us coming up this year, of course, is U.S. elections. Everybody's interested in U.S. elections. We do a big party um, for U.S. elections. We are in the process of getting a new ambassador. Our current ambassador is getting ready to leave. Um, we do have a new ambassador. She's being officially sworn in in Washington the end of September, and we'll be here sometime in October, and probably her first big public event is going to be an elections party. So we would love to have you all involved. Um, we'd love to have you come work and be part of the event, but you know, do some fun activities and things. So um, we that will be the night of the elections. Obviously, we don't know where yet. Um, we're sort of working out the yeah. details. But if you all are willing to do things like Lollapalooza, um, you know, the election night, um, and of course, we'd like to be able to include you. Uh, if we have visiting senators and congressmen, for example, they always want to meet people from their district. So last year we had a bunch of congressional delegations, and okay, what Fulbrighters from Texas, right? we got to make sure they're there. Um, so that kind of thing. Um, but also if there are specific areas of interest, you know, please don't hesitate to reach out to us as well. We're not a big scary place. So um, that's sort of my public affairs spiel. Um, from a, a safety and American citizen perspective, just want to make sure that you all know, and I don't know how much they tell you, have you all registered with the embassy here through STEP? STEP, you have? Right. Yes. It's required with the Gilman Scholars. <coughs> yes, good. good. Yeah. Okay. Good. Because, you know, we're in Chile, there are earthquakes. Um, <laughs> they're every day, you may not feel them, but pretty much. So, yeah, in case of any kind of emergency, um, we want to be able to, to reach you and, and make sure that you're okay and, you know, provide assistance as needed. So glad to know everyone's registered with STEP. Um, please, you know, consider the U.S. Embassy your home. If you have issues that you need to see the consular section about as American citizens, they're there to help you. Um, but professional and other exchange type activities, reach out to me, reach out to Diana, or through Fulbright, and you know we're happy to help <laughs> connect you and draw you into activities as we can. Um, what I always tell Fulbrighters, and, and it's the same for you, is I mean you all as U.S. government grantees here in Chile are ambassadors in and of your own right. Um, the U.S. and we know you will. Um, act accordingly and not do crazy things. But if you do get into trouble, please let us know, and we'll do what we can to help you out. Yeah. Any questions about the embassy or anything that we can do, or anything that you all are interested in that you know you have questions for us about? I have, I have a question. Yeah. Let's say I, I do get into trouble, or I'm in. Uh, See, what would be the easiest way to contact you? <laughs> you, um, there is an emergency phone number mm -hmm. that you contact, but um, if you just if you just call the U.S. Embassy number, everybody should put it into their phone, right? It's five six two two three three zero three thousand. I don't know the emergency number by memory, no, but but, but it's if, on the get, if you get a, if you get it's arrested, you can yeah. say. Please call the embassy. Yes. I mean, that's the law. Yeah. So um, we do have Marines. We have duty officers. So there's somebody 24 hours available. I mean, don't abuse it. Like, really, yeah. please don't call at 2 in the morning unless it's an emergency. But, um, yeah, there are. there's always an American officer who's on duty to, in case something happens. So arrests, being in the hospital, you know, needing to find people, um, 
passport anything being wrong. Passport yeah, being wrong. losing your passport. Yeah, be careful with that. Security wise, I'm sure you all, you know, how long have you been here? Two months. Two months. Yeah, with two months, you more or less know. So you yeah, know, right, like yeah. you don't yeah, sling you your backpack on your shoulder and walk casually down the street. Well, you don't, you don't yourself, hang oh, your. You don't look for Pokemon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You don't hang your purse um, or backpack on a chair in a restaurant ever, 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 <laughs> because it just it happens. It's yeah. Chile's yeah. not a, a scary place, but these things happen. Yeah all the time and before you know it. So yeah, keep your bag in front, keep yeah. your hands Don't on your hands. Hand here. Yeah. Particularly and at Starbucks. This, this, yeah. This week, because I have a story. Um, <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah, no, it's it's it yeah. it happens to everyone. Um, it's it, Starbucks it's almost so yeah, so I have my passport taken from a car once. Yeah. 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 Don't yeah. carry your yeah. passport around. Yeah. Yeah. Photocopy if you can Yeah, yeah. It's, it's better to keep don't, carry, with a, don't with ever a, carry your passport copy. around with yeah. you. I mean, you need it if you're, you know, traveling. traveling but, it, yeah. Right. But okay. otherwise, like, don't keep it in your purse. Don't, yeah. Uh, let me ask this. Uh, what type of visa are you with? It's a student visa. Student it's student a student visa. visa. Okay, great. Great. Yeah. So that allows you to get a... Um, RIT. AID, right? Yeah. Uh, it makes a huge difference having yes. the ID number. I just carry that idea. Very hard process. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah. It's, it's not easy. Yeah. 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 It's a long process. Yeah, you have to go to the police. There's a lot of bureaucracy. Yeah. 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 There's a process, and you follow that process. Yeah. Don't try and like change it or make it more efficient, because yeah. no. that's what it is. Yeah. 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 Efficiency doesn't matter. It's, that's the way it is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and, and we, we've, we've included you in our database, so all the activities we will be doing from here to the end of the year you will be invited, okay? There are not that many, uh, but, but still, it's great, yeah. 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 So can I sign you guys all up for election night? Yeah. Yeah? That, that's really good. No, that's really good. Yeah. It's mandatory. It's really good. Hopefully it'll be fun. It's going to be a late night, yeah. you know? Final results in, what, sometime around 2 a.m.? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's pretty normal in yeah. Chile. Yeah. <laughs> you all would know that better than me. I have kids. I'm in bed. <laughs> um, yeah. Great. Great. We um, there's um, the 12th of September at the Ritz Carlton, which mm -hmm. is in okay. Metro El Golf. There is a U.S. Fair. education fair. Um, uh, universities from the U.S. are coming. Um, you know, showing their offer uh, to potential Chilean students. It's a good place to meet people, if you want. Yeah, it's <laughs> but there's a lot of people. I mean, or maybe some of your universities will be represented. Yeah. I know you see Urban has been here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but it's free and it's, it's really you know, you can go mingle with Chilean students or prospective. You know, kind of there's last year there were about a thousand Chilean students who came. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. At, at least, at least I would say, yeah. We had one year, yeah. it was like 3,000. Yeah. So the last year, yeah. at least last year. Yeah. Yeah. Hey. It was when the ambassador yeah. came hey. for the first time. Was yeah. first year. And yes. there are you in several U.S. See, universities yeah. that have offices like here in Chile. I don't think any of your universities are specifically represented, but... Um, yes, no, Syracuse, 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 Syracuse University has, a, has, yeah. a, has an office here. Right. Columbia, MIT, Harvard... Um, George, George Washington, American. Washington, you, um, yeah, in Catolica you have several, yeah. Yeah. four or five, yeah. 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 Middlebury, I think Really? Permanently? There's someone in Chile who represents uh, okay. Notre Dame, the same thing. Notre Dame, okay. yeah. yeah. There's yeah. a Florida head also, I yeah. I'm not sure if it's still. I think he has. I think so, yeah. because I haven't I've been able to find him, yeah. 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 And at the Catolica, yeah. there's an um, an English center where we also help fund yeah, an yeah. academic writing center, and so there's you know little bits and pieces everywhere. Do you all know what Education USA is? I mentioned briefly. It's sort of it's a U.S. government affiliated with the State Department, but they provide educational advising services and some administer some scholarships and things for people who want to study, Chileans who want to study in the U.S. But we have education representatives around. Um, the, the head of Education USA Chile is here in Santiago. Her name is Brenda Pasoldan. They help run the Education USA Fair. 
Um, in the past, several good ones have served as interns in the Education USA office, and I know they're always looking for people to, you know, help out with their activities or to meet with Chilean students. Um, so they're good people to make contact with. Maybe Brenda could use the help at the fair. Them yeah. The the um, so they're they're based there's there's Education USA here at Fulbright, but Brenda's office is based at the Universidad Mayor right now. Um, most of the other Education USA offices across Chile are in our binational centers. So we do have um, binational centers, which are called the Instituto Chileno Norteamericano. There's a big one in Santiago with several branches. The one in Santiago is down um, right near La Moneda. Um, they're undergoing a big renovation this year, but they also host a lot of events, movie series, or art exhibits. Um, in addition, they teach English. So they're very closely affiliated with the U.S. Embassy. We collaborate with them a lot on programming. Um, but it's worth sort of checking out some of those. I put all of our social media properties on the back of my card, so you guys you know, follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, we post things out there, mm -hmm. we post sure. things from um, the binational centers. But yeah, we have one in Valparaiso. So if you go to Valparaiso, we're checking it out. In La Serena, in Concepcion, Curico. in Curico, in Chian. Um, and then we also have what we call American Corners which is much more um, closely tied to the U.S. Embassy, but they're based in Chilean universities. It's generally a room or a part um, in the library where we have a person who also does activities, whether it's bringing U.S. speakers or maybe having English conversation clubs. They'll have books, they'll have magazines, movies, things like that. So in Santiago, um, we have two. One is at um, Universidad Diego Portales, and the other is um, a very specialized corner. It's, it's our science corner. It's actually the Universidad Talca, but here in Santiago, we do a lot of STEM and science-based programming there. But we have those in Magallanes, down in Punta Arenas, all the way up to Arica. Um, so as you're traveling around, there are other sort of touch points that you can check in. And it's a good way to meet people, and you can always let them know you're a U.S. student if you need anything. The people that work at the binational centers and corners are good people to touch base with. They know their communities, they're willing to help, um, and can provide suggestions. And, and they're always dying to meet, you know, American students or have people volunteer, intern, all that kind of stuff. So.